And I know that we have about 53 people who are um, joining today. So I'll, you know, Alex, we think give them a couple minutes more. Perfect. Anyone else want to jump in and, and tell us a little bit about your your background in in data journalism? And it sounds like everyone's kind of so far is newbies, which is absolutely fine. And while folks are uh, jumping in with that, I do want to just remind everybody that this session is uh, being recorded. Dimitri, you're not driving. Oh no, I'm at home right now. I was so afraid that I'll be late. So I just connected five minutes before and I was driving. Keep on the wheel by one hand, by one hand. keeping you guys in another one. I'm going to swing my camera well, well, around and show you the thunderstorm coming. Oh. And in the meantime, we hope we are all oh, able to it. drive some awesome data story. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> this one of warm people on the call that Bill likes to have, likes to play with his words. He's into the homonym kind of stuff. So. <laughs> Dimitri, what's your background? So I'm a correspondent of the Ukraine and television working here in Washington, D.C. I was a news presenter of the main show of the country, and um, uh, it's my third year in Washington. And I'm so excited about the, the things you are sharing with us because, you know, uh, 20 years in television, but oh, during the pandemic, I'm I feel absolutely dummy uh, because we need these new technologies, these new interviews, all, all is online. Uh, time to time, I'm calling and person is, you know, just answering and, 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 and forgot that I'm, I'm recording and doing something at the kitchen. So sometime I'm live and I forgot that <laughs> I'm live and I'm doing something. So it's a new reality. And thank you for <laughs> yes. sharing this, this new reality with us. No problem. If Bill and Vera and Caitlin are okay, if you want, we can start. Sounds great. Sounds good to me. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm going to introduce uh, myself first. I'm Alex Segura. I'm a board member at the Association of Foreign Correspondents in the U.S. I'm the Los Angeles chair, and I want to welcome you all. And on behalf the, of the association, uh, we want to stress the importance of these training programs and how valuable they are for us as a journalist and also as a foreign journalist. And also, we, we want to highlight. We journalism. You want to see this? Please, if you can uh, mute yourselves while we are in process. We also want to highlight our great partnership with Microsoft and Microsoft News. And we can also welcome and, and really want to welcome some additional guests that we have today with us that are uh, foreign journalists based in the UK. And they are uh, part of the Foreign Press Association of London in the UK. This is a new, fairly new partnership that we have with them. So also welcome you all uh, to our uh, great training session with uh, some of the greatest experts on, on data journalism. And now I'll hand uh, the presentation over to Bill Monroe. Bill? Hey, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. We are so happy to be here uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you happen to be. Uh, my name is Bill Monroe. I am a uh, product trainer with Microsoft. I help people use and love products and services they already have. I've been doing this for more than 20 years because I love talking about this stuff. And when I'm not talking about this stuff, I do host a couple of podcasts on improving your public speaking skills and using PowerPoint, as well as on stroke rehab and recovery. Uh, personally, I happen to identify as House Ravenclaw, and you can find me on Twitter where I am at currently Bill. And I am going to be joined by Vera and Kathleen today. 
And before we go further, I do want to just remind, uh, mention a couple of key things. First of all, uh, we are recording this session, so please be aware of that. Secondly, as you um, go through the training and as you watch the demonstration, we'd encourage your questions in the chat room. If you don't have the chat room visible on your screen, please look for the cartoon thought bubble, the comic strip speech bubble on your screen and click that and that will show a column called meeting chat. As you put additional comments in the meeting chat, we will be able to address them in there and we will share questions uh, live as we go uh, from that from that chat, as well as a wrap up Q&A at the end. And of course, we'll be asking some questions as we go along, too. So definitely keep that uh, keep that visible to yourself. If you are able to see it, that is awesome. If you are able to safely do so. Obviously, those joining us from the car, we don't recommend you follow that meeting chat. Uh, anyway, uh, with that, let's meet the rest of the team. So uh, Kathleen, why don't you tell Sorry. us a little bit about yourself, and then we will uh, hear from Vera. All right. I'm Kathleen Crowley. I am a reporter fr from the Albany Times Union in upstate New York. And my data journey started with just my daily beat coverage. I've covered just about every beat there is, and I worked with this Excel. That was my entry into this, and it's happened over the process of 20 years, and um, I looked around the newsroom. We used to have data journalists in our newsroom, but with layoffs and attrition, suddenly I looked around and I was the only one in the newsroom who even knew basic Excel. And I decided, well, that, that's kind of an opportunity to make myself the data person in my, in my newsroom. And that was just about six or seven years ago that I started really digging in. But with Excel, I just kind of hit a wall. Um, it's a great tool and um, great for, for bringing in data, a data set. But when you want to join data sets and do deeper things, I couldn't get past VLOOKUPs and, and pivot tables. Um, so I came across Power BI and it's been just a, a great tool because I'm just a, a data journalist of one in our newsroom. I'm handling my work and, and some other data projects for other reporters. And so I'm working fast on deadline. I have to clean up data sets, sometimes join them and create data visualizations. And I've been able to do that all within Power BI and do it pretty quickly. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to showing you this tool today. Thanks, Bill. Vera? Hey, good times of all of all time zones. Thanks for uh, having us today. Thanks for joining. Uh, I, I might be familiar to some of you already. Vera Chan, we had a chance to work with uh, AFC and do a presentation of the general Microsoft News Labs. Um, I've been in journalism for, uh, well, at least definitely, I think it covers two centuries, I can say that. Um, and my background, you know, uh, covers, you know, daily print, uh, weeklies, and I also worked at Yahoo and, and of course, Microsoft Now. And m mainly my beat was A&E, culture reporting. But, you know, you know what it's like as a reporter. If you can do certain types of stories, you just go and c cover all sorts of beats. And that's what I've done. Um, <clears throat> and since uh, I was trying to make this kind of as many points as Bill had, he had four points, so I put in, I am an aspiring author, so uh, if, I will, once I get an agent, but if someone knows an agent, let me know, uh, just, just ping me offline, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Fast Talking D. So today, of course, we are going to be talking about um, journalism, uh, sorry, data journalism, and you, for those, again, who joined our last session, you know that Microsoft has worked with newsrooms for decades. And the Microsoft News ecosystem um, includes MSN, Bing, and other distribution channels. Uh, MSN works with about 1,200 publishers. You likely work with one of the 4,500 media brands that reaches about a half billion readers around the world. And so as a result of all the work that we have um, done with newsrooms, that puts us in a really good position to kind of partner and offer complementary training um, Bill is here. Uh, you know, Kathleen, of course, will be doing the Power BI training, but Bill has also uh, done training with newsrooms about um, Office 365, and now called M365. So uh, about you know, communications, newsroom operations, and reporting. What are the tools that that will help you? So, Dimitri, hit us up. Let us know if you need any more help from your kitchen. Um, so the data journalism program in particular, we've been doing it for the last like th four or five years, worked with directly with more than 100 partners uh, from newswires to local stations and as well as membership industry groups at conferences like NICAR, where Kathleen, for instance, has uh, led, a, led, us, led us a couple sessions. 
And just wanted to go over some of the things that, you know, uh, Kathleen will talk specifically about some of the things that she's created, as well as some things that are actually off the shelf right now that every single person on this call can use. And again, in the chat, uh, we're not only sharing our email alias so that you can follow up with us, but also links to resources that you can use today. And um, oh, uh, let's see, hold on. Someone just took my. I'm, I'm just playing. Um, uh, someone just took my presentation. Hang on. <laughs> so whoever's doing that, that's fun. It's, so this is sort of the power of presenting where you can have um, where you can kind of play bingo with your presentations. All right. So as I was saying, uh, one of the examples that I wanted to uh, show you a few a few of the examples that we've done with our partners, Politico uh, EU, for instance, they were actually looking for a way to convey the continental repercussions of a single citizen's vote. So we worked with them for um, you know about a year leading up to the elections, about you know with this on the left hand side a horseshoe visualization based on polling and other data to see like the different types of alliances that might happen and allow people to drill down at the you know county level so very complex uh, storytelling that takes place over time uh, actually in recode similar to kathleen this is the work of just one reporter right uh, and covering disparate stories whether it's like business or tech stories or in the far left hand corner that you might see on the screen is the classic grocery cart milk prices comparison story. And you can see that how the different types of visualizations are really meant to not only convey uh, data in a very meaningful kind of way, uh, but also to um, really entice engagement and learning. So I think there is somehow a way that you guys are able to grab my 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 demo. So hold think, up for just I think a moment. Abdul just grabbed it, hopefully by yeah. mistake. Oh, yes. And uh, let's see. Hold on. And I am just going to share and I'm, I'm about to share the wrong day thing. Hang on. <laughs> All right. So. Let me just get back here. And don't worry, the, like for those of you who don't like reason like presentations like this, mine is almost over and, and Kathleen's going to show you the good stuff, but I'm almost done showing you here. Uh, but in terms of like the different types of visualizations that you can use uh, with uh, Power BI is a tool that we're going to be talking about today. And um, what's really good about it too is that you can actually use these same, the, you know, kind of the backbones of this and and cover different types of stories. The milk price story, you can use that to compare salaries of like NBA players, for instance, right? So that becomes a very interesting way to cut back on the number of um, repeat work that you have to do. And I just want to show you this one other example. This is not actually data reporting per se. This is actually a table of contents, right? Um, Non-obvious use Power BI is a navigation tool to create a menu or kind of a visual table of contents to access more than 100 different trends. So um, that is, uh, sorry, I'm running into a little bit of a problem here. So you know what? Um, I don't need to present the deck, but I do want to tell you that background of Power BI, is, it's intended, it was intended to be a business intelligence dashboard, right? Um, so if you're familiar with Excel and Photoshop, Power BI actually is relatively straightforward to pick up. This is why, and we we found this out, and this is why we thought like, well, the need for data journalism to reach audiences, to have them engaged, to, you know, build up that trust and credibility because like they want to see the data and they also want to see the relevance of that data. COVID-19 is one data set that we're going to share with you guys. And yes, it is vitally important to see on a global scale how people are dealing with it, but people also want to see what's happening in their own neighborhood as well. So we have shared a link in the chat, as I said, that you can access three visualizations today. Uh, we created one on voter turnout. Um, these are, of course, for all US centric, but again, this information, the, the if you want to take the time to learn how to adapt Power BI and feed in your own data, you can do that. Um, we include some teachings with that, but we did include vo voter turnout, uh, campaign finance, and COVID-19. So let me hand it over to Kathleen and she's going to walk through building her own visualizations and uh, show uh, also the COVID-19 data on the state and county level. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, excellent. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you a couple of uh, visualizations I've done. This is a, a July 4th traffic um, based on toll booth data in our area. And if you click on best time, 
It'll show you the best time to leave, the worst time to leave. And my, my absolute favorite is the, uh, the early birds who get out on the road early and create their own traffic jam. <laughs> so don't leave early. Um, this is a <laughs> tick and Lyme disease where I, I combine three different data sets. It's the, um, the, the prevalence of, of or the occurrence of Lyme disease by county in our area, the number of deer taken killed by hunters in the area, each county, and also the number of ticks that test positive in the area. They literally take sheets and, and drag them across the fields and test how many ticks come back with Lyme disease. It's a, a very... Uh, uh, a nasty disease in our area and very so when you click on the um, the counties each one of these visuals changes and uh, one of the beautiful things about Power BI is that the interactivity is the default when you when you put multiple visuals on one page each one changes uh, when you click on the other um, so I'm going to build two visuals right before your eyes and unfortunately I'm, I apologize they're both kind of depressing topics um, one is going to be about COVID, and the other is um, about the, hor de the death of racing horses. Um, we have a horse track in our coverage area, and so we try to keep track of how many horses die each season, which is unfortunate way too many of them do. And please, Bill's going to be tracking the chat room, and um, if you have questions, please send them off to Bill, and uh, he'll relay them to me, and I would love to have questions. Um, I've been busy grilling Kathleen on all sorts of questions in our various rehearsals. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to open Power BI. Sorry, sorry guys. Uh, so I'm just going to open here. I'm going to right click on my Power BI, and you're going to see some of the uh, my recent thing, my recent store, my recent um, projects I've worked on. But I have a template here, and I click on that. It comes up with my fonts, my color palette. I've already preset this and saved this. So every time I open that template, it gives me a blank document with all my my things that I use and reuse in it. And uh, it's, it makes things much speedier, especially when I'm working on deadline. Uh, I think it's slow because of that. We got a call going and I've got a few other drafts up. So it's taking a little bit of time here. And I think that's one of the things that's really I really like about this tool is that uh, while it's working with a lot of those external data resources, and as you see, as it's pulling in a lot of this other stuff, it's still an application where you're doing most of the work on your desk, uh, your desktop on your own computer, rather than necessarily having to build it on the web. So you're not uh, working with uh, pulling down all the bandwidth all the time while it is uh, while it's doing a lot of the actual building. Is, is that uh, an accurate interpretation, Kathleen? Yes, yes. And here we go. Here's my template. Um, has my headline, my subheads, and my source and logo all set up. But, but when you come in, you're going to see a blank page like this. And let me give you a little orientation to, to the workspace here. This blank area is a canvas and where, where, where I spend most of my time creating the visualization part of, of, of my project. Um, and, but everything kind of starts over here. On the far left, we have our fields. Right now, it's, I'm sorry, on the far right. On the far right in the fields, it's blank right now because I don't have any data sets connected here. But once I have a, some data in here, you'll see all your column headers in the field side. Then we have the vis visualization pane and it shows you all the default visuals that come in Power BI. You can actually go out and get more. There's more available um, by clicking on get more visuals. And down here beneath the visual pane, this changes depending on which, which visual you've selected. And it's, it's looking for what data fields you want to add there. And once I have the fields, I'll just literally drag them over and drop them into these empty buckets. Um, and then over on this other, the filter pane, we can create powerful filters to, um, if you want to reduce what your, your data is looking at or, or just narrow down to one country, one state, one county, you can really uh, narrow in there. So the first thing we need to do is get our data. So we hit the get data button over here at the top ribbon and a window is going to come up showing me all the different ways that we can pull data into Power BI. 
And the list is very long. The obvious ones are Excel, CSV files, which are, are basically like Excel files. It can bring in PDFs, uh, which is, and it can pull tables out of out of PDFs, and it does a very good job. I've used the the tool Taboola in the past, but I'm I'm finding this just just as well. And the list is lengthy. You can do Google Sheets. Um, and you can do the web. You can scrape from the web and you can do APIs. We are going to do something called OData, and I'll show you a little bit what that is. It's an OData feed. It's basically an open data feed, which is how New York hosts its, uh, its data sets. I'm going to go back to the web and show you. This is the New York State open data site and it has hundreds of data sets here. Here's their equine death and breakdowns, which tracks all the racing, the deaths of racing horses in the state. I go over to export, and one of the ways I can download it, has many ways, is you can download it as an Excel file, but we're gonna, I'm gonna tap into the OData uh, data feed. It's basically a, a link where it, once you go to the link, you get the most up-to-date version of the data every time you go. So I just copy this, control copy, copying that link there. And I go back to our Power BI and I'm going to paste it in. Hit OK. And it's going to pull the data down from New York. Here it is. And I can just load it right in and start making visuals or I can transform the data. I can clean it up. And you usually do want to clean up your data because say you have a column that has the names of the racetrack and someone misspells the racetrack in one of the columns, that will throw your, your data numbers off. So you just want to do a, a check and make sure that everything kind of lines up. And here, this is called the Power Query window. It's kind of like uh, being in the, the garage. Of, of Power Query. You're looking under the hood of the data. This is where you do all your data transformations and clean them up or reduce the number, you know, eliminate columns if you don't need a column. Um, this is where you make your, your data perfect. And I do want to do a little data cleanup here, actually. Um, let's go look here. Oh, and I also want to point out this, this row here at the very top. It kind of gives me a quick snapshot of my my data sets, so how many different um, col different rows, uh, distinct and unique, are within that column. It gives you a quick insight into how many things are in each row. Um, one thing I need to look at here is the year, and the data type of the year. It's it's showing up as a number, and you don't you don't want your year to show up as a number because you don't want uh, 2020 to be added to 2020. It's not a, a situation where you you sum. It's actually a category, so we want to make it text. So the, just see this little 1.2 next to the year. I click on that, and I'm going to tell tell Power BI that's actually text. So please change that into text. And I also want to clean up the track names. They're really long. And once I get to the visual, the creating um, visual graphics with this, some of them will make the uh, visual way too long and big and, and, and make the words have to wrap around. So I want, I want to make them smaller. And you'll notice this looks a lot like Excel. And that's what made this um, moving into Power BI much easier for me and for anyone who has a little Excel experience. Uh, it, it looks similar. So I'm just going to do kind of a search and replace type of thing. I want Monticello Raceway. I'm going to right click on it and click on replace values. And this should look pretty similar to you, just like when you work in Word, Microsoft Word, f find and replace. I want this right whole click, thing. Right place. So your place is right click, right? That was a right click. Yeah, I have the app dot power bi i don't know if i have the all the features that you're showing the the app the online app does not have all these features um you need to download microsoft desktop it is <laughs> it is the, the full package of, of features and it is, it is free to download um and if you if you work in an organization that has a microsoft license it's pretty much entirely free 
Yeah, can you show me how to do that? Because I'm also an adjunct professor at the university on data science. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm using the app. It doesn't give everything because I'm doing some work on COVID. Okay, for, so we can do that uh, offline, okay? Offline, yeah. I'll put my name there. We can keep it. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. And, and I think this is also a good time to uh, point out that while you do download this application to work on your device, it, it we are talking about a Windows application. Uh, the full application that your that Kathleen is actually creating these things in is not available for uh, Mac OS. Is, is, yeah, is this will be Windows that 10. Great. And my organization is the State University in New Jersey. But great. I don't know so, how to download. I just got the app and doesn't give everything. Great. Know? So that great. So that sounds like something we'll be able to follow up with offline to uh, yeah. point out. That how do I get and, your number? You give us your and, phone number, right? Your contact. And, and uh, Vera, uh, it, is the link for the application also available in the Power BI resources on the training site? Where where do I go? Are oh, you putting on the link? I'm confirming that the link is there first, but uh, we do have all sorts of training resources available at aka.ms slash training videos. And we're going to post that link again uh, in okay. the chat several times. Yeah. Um, and again, I'd also content. encourage anybody who has uh, questions to please go ahead and include those in the chat as well so we can keep track of those uh, and bring them forward as Kathleen uh, continues to go through uh, this material and, and cleaning up some of the data to make it even that much more usable. So I cleaned up the track name and I changed the name of the uh, the data set. It just came in with a really uh, generic name of query one. So I, I changed it to equine deaths. That's a, a smart thing to do, especially if you're gonna be adding multiple data sets so you can keep track of which data set is which. Um, I do wanna point out this ID column. It is really a nice thing to have a unique ID in your data. And in this case, it's a unique ID for every uh, incident where the, at, at the tracks. And uh, speaking of incidents, we want to limit this data set to just um, equine deaths. So here's the incident type, and it has, it has accidents and injuries listed in here as well. So I'm just going to filter it by clicking on this arrow right here. Right now it has select all. I'm going to deselect, select all, and then I'm just going to click equine deaths and hit OK. And that is now going to filter my data down to just equine deaths, which is what I'm interested in right now. And I'm done cleaning this up. And now I hit close and apply. And this is basically going to take us out of the garage and back into our main workspace where we can start building visuals. It's applying the changes I made right now. Oh, also, this does not change the underlying data set. The, data, the, the original data set is untouched. It just keeps track of the changes that you want to make to it. All right, so now you see on the right, on the right side, we have the fields column, and this has all the, the column headers from our data set. I'm gonna expand that a bit so you can see it. All right, and I'm gonna go back to, and you, we're gonna use my template. The first thing I wanna do is create a column chart to see how many equine deaths there were each year. So I go over to my visualization pane and select my visual. I'm going to use uh, the column chart. I click on that and it shows up here on my workspace as an empty container. And now you see under here we have these fields, these buckets, and we want we need to fill them with the header, the column headers with the data that we want to highlight. So for axis, I want to put year there. I'm going to click and drag the year right over there, and that adds it. Nothing much happened yet. Here I have the values bucket, and I want to put for values. I want to put the incidents, the, the each incident that happened. So I'm going to use that unique ID. I'm going to grab that unique ID, and I'm going to put it in there. And since it's a text field, it can't sum it, it's going to count it. And if you look at the years here, something funky is happening. Anyone kind of notice what's going on? It has to do with the sort. It is sorting by from highest to lowest. 
And when we when you have years like this, we actually want it to the years to be in chronological order. So let's fix that. To do that, I go to the, the top right corner of this visual and click on these three dots here. When I click on that, I get a few more options. I have sort options here. And the sort by, I'm going to choose year. Right now it's on the, the count. So I chose year. And now it's it's search. It's going from most recent to oldest. I'm going to switch that around. I click on those dots again, and I'm going to sort ascending. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So now we can see the number of equine deaths uh, in New York State by year. Let's style it up a bit so it's easier for the reader. When we want to style your visual, we head on over here to this little paintbrush. And that's the formatting tab and that op opens up a lot of different formatting options for you. I, I found that Power BI has some very powerful visual tools um, right up there with Adobe Illustrator. Um, you, if you've worked with Microsoft PowerPoint, it has kind of very similar feel to that. There's a lot of artistic things you can do here. So your your visual design people will have fun here. Uh, <laughs> So, of course, and I heard uh, Microsoft is teaming up with SAS, Statistical Analysis God, System. That's, that's all over my head. <laughs> yeah, gonna... so this will be the most powerful analytic tool in the world, the Microsoft BI, Power BI, SAS, and all your, you know, <laughs> things. That's what I hear, so looking oh. forward to it. All right. Yeah, what I would like to do, I to help my readers, and if it makes sense, I like to put the actual value of each bar right on top of the bar. So on this data labels, I'm going to turn that to on, and you'll see the numbers appear on the chart, the numbers of uh, how many deaths happened each year. And I'm going to scroll down because there has the option of showing a little background behind those numbers, and I think that looks sharp having that little background behind there. And I would like to get rid of this little by. By default, it brings in, it tells you the name of the field that you're using, and I don't, we don't need that there, so I'm going to get rid of that. I scroll down, and we have the title here, and I'm going to turn that off. And I could even turn this axis off. Since I have the numbers on each bar, I don't think we need these numbers on the left side, so I'm going to turn that Y, that's the Y axis, I'm going to turn that off. And that's a nice, clean looking chart. Um, but now I want to add some interactivity. How would you add interactivity to this? I think one way we well, can... I would do it by calling Kathleen. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. What we could do is we have many tracks in New York. Let's add um, a user filter where they can click and choose which track they want to look at. So now I click off. I make sure I'm not clicked on anything. And I'm going to add a new visual, and this is called the slicer. It's like a filter, and it's going to be available to the reader, to, to your end user, so they can interact with your chart and your data. So it pops up right there. It's empty. I need to put in the, a field, and I'm going to bring track. I'm going to drag it, click and drag it right over to the field. And now you see all the tracks show up right there. And now maybe you can see why I, I edited some of them so they were shorter. If Monticello Raceway and Gaming and whatever that was would have gone off here into nowhere land. So I tightened that up. Um, so there are my tracks. And let me show you. I'm going to hit click on Belmont and watch this chart down here. It changed. I'll hit Saratoga. It changes. Saratoga Raceway and Saratoga race course are actually different tracks. They're right around the corner from each other, but one is a trotter track where the, they have a little uh, carriage behind the horse. Um, so this is, I mentioned to you how Power BI, in, in Power BI, the interactivity is the default. In some tools I've used, you, you literally have to hand uh, create all the interactivity between each chart. But in this case, it just automatically assumes you want them to be interactive which is one reason why this is a very fast tool for making, making visuals on deadline. And I can resize this just by clicking and dragging. It's very intuitive. 
I can click and drag to move it around. And you can see these red guides show up to, to make sure, you know, for the artistic folks out there, making sure you're lining things up the way you ex want them to be lined up. I'm, uh, I, I'm going to style this, the, the filter a little bit. Let's go over to the filter tab. That's that paintbrush right over there. I'm going to turn off the, the default header, but I'm going to add my own title. I have found my readers need a lot of tips on how to interact. A lot of our users aren't used to this um, ability to interact with the, with the data. So I, I try to give them little hints. So select a track. I'm going to type that in there. I'm going to change the font color to something bright that screams. To say, touch me, hit me. Here's my palette. That's the, the my Times Union palette that I have saved and preloaded here. And let's make that a little bigger, the text size. And I'll make it a little bolder, Segoy bold there. Nice. I'm going to click off Belmont. One of the things you have to remember is uh, when you hit save, whatever you have selected is going to say, stay saved. Will be the the default that the that the visual opens for your when, when your reader opens it. That that is how, what it's going to open to. So if I had Saratoga selected and I hit save and then I, I published it, it would open up on Saratoga. In this case, I just want it to be open for everyone. I'm just gonna quickly do a little uh, subhead here. Maybe some folks can suggest a headline for this, for this visual. Um, so let's hear, uh, what do you have, what would you suggest as a headline for this visual? Go ahead and let us know in the chat. And while people are suggesting some headlines in our uh, in our meeting chat over here in this column, um, we do have a question from Dimitri about uh, where visualizations are meant for. Is it more for newspapers or websites or TV specifically somehow? So could you, uh, as, as people come up with some suggested titles for this visualization, could could you, Kathleen, talk a little bit about where these visualizations actually live. Sure. For me, uh, we put them, we post them on our website. I also have um, downloaded them, exported them as a PDF, which is which is a uh, editable in Adobe Illustrator, and we have used some of them in print. Um, there are newspapers. I, Vera showed a, showed a couple slides in her deck that are from um, the TV stations, TV stations have used these as live, live uh, TV displays where you know they're going through candidates and, and counties live on TV and interacting with it right on TV. Um, so it is very flexible and uh, user friendly. Is yeah, and good I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, uh, Dimitri, actually, my my deck got taken away just before the King Five. Um, but what the one of the um, links that we've shared and that we'll share again later includes a data journalism playbook that was actually that we worked with with the TV station. King Five is a Seattle affiliate of a techno station, and they did a series of um, visualizations on immunization and um, traffic and lots of stories, uh, elections, and they had to design it both to look good on broadcast as well as for the website, right? So there's definitely aesthetic sensibilities that you do need to take care of. They did in this particular case, uh, partner with a, um, a, what we call a Microsoft Gold partner to help that really make the visualizations pop, but it's something that you can learn on your own as well. And uh, we can also even connect you to that TV station. So back to you, Kathleen. And I am going to add a link to that uh, playbook into the chat in just a quick moment here. Any headlines? I haven't seen any uh, any headlines yet. Okay. Let me just get back I'll over that window. Huh. This this is dangerous when our our native snarkiness starts coming through. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. So I I, I styled the uh, while while Vera was chatting, I, I styled the the filter a little bit, so it has a gray background, also calling it out. Yeah, cool. Very nice. Thank you. And I, I'm not going to go into this right now. I'm going to show yeah, you an existing. No, that's fine. Um, I got the link, so I'll oh, download. But oh, this is good. so interesting for layman's point of view to look at data and you know. Thanks so much for um, your time. 
And I want to show you another version of this that I, that I had made previously. This is like a cooking show where the, the final product is is in another oven. So I'm going to pull this one out of the oven for you. This so is another this one, is, and I I added a couple extra oven? pages. Dying Sorry. To, oh, dying to this raise. is still oh, no no no. This is still, this is still the uh, horse racing. Okay. And I, I created a couple other pages where you can dive in and see the numbers by jockey and by trainers. And Power BI has this uh, sweet uh, tool where you can create buttons and help them and they can navigate to other pages in your in your visual. And for the, the end user, it feels like, like you're in a little app. It's like a little storybook that you're in and you can flip the pages. So I, I can just click on explore more and I will go to the the number of deaths by jockey. I could I could filter by year if I wanted to. And then I can go click on the trainers and see how many equine deaths there were by the, the horse trainers. And then I can go click the back button and go back to the, the, the main page. So there's my my horse racing death visual. Any questions on that before we move on to the, the COVID? <laughs> the co <laughs> Sorry about all the death folks. <laughs> That's the news, I guess. But uh, please uh, forward your questions to, to Bill because I would love to answer them. Yeah, this is a good example, I, you know, to teach small children and you know, just to show them instead of COVID, right? So all <laughs> the other sets are good for different part. Population, you know, children yep. by age then. Maybe 20 plus need to know more about COVID. So we'll look forward to that now. Thank you. No, no problem. Uh, we do have a, a question from Diana. Uh, how do you you how do you um, create the explore button or the uh, back button? How do you integrate that into your your visuals so people can go uh, back and forward? How, so, to, so to create it, I'll just uh, show you quickly up here on the the home the home ribbon. Is the home ribbon. This is not showing me all the. Let me uh, go. Let me go back to the one I was building for. In, in the demo. So up here in the ribbon, we can insert, hit insert and hit button. So I'll add a button. We can add a blank button. Here it is right here. This is our button. And you can add text to it. You can change the color. You can make the border round, round, or you can make the border disappear. You can style that whichever way you want. And then here under the under the style tab, you can choose the action. I'm going to turn the action on. The default is it making it a back button. So if I, I just chose that, it would just go back to whatever page you were on. Or you can choose page navigation and tell it what page to go to. The destination would be, it's picking up, if you look down here, here are the, my page, na page names down here. You can tell them which page to go to if the user clicks on that. And there's another very powerful version you can use. You can make it a, a bookmark. So bookmark is handy. Sometimes I have a data set, uh, like with the, the coronavirus testing, where I had a New York State visual data set. But I, our, our coverage area, my readers are only in about six counties in the, in the capital, the Albany region. So I can make a, I could filter it down to just my counties which is called the capital region and save it as a bookmark. It's kind of like saving a view of it. And I just name that bookmark capital region and then create a button like this and have it navigate to that bookmark. So when they click on it right now, uh, there are some bookmarks here. If they click on the jockey bookmark, but this the case would be the capital region bookmark. You click on that and it will show just the capital region. It's a really neat way to, uh, to, engage your readers and, and, and show them the areas that they're interested in, or maybe even showing them highlights of the of the data that you think are interesting. Like the early birds on my my traffic visual, <laughs> that's a bookmark. I bookmarked the, the, the early birds and highlighted that. And, and what I like about that is that we have all of these sort of informal, informal um, 
regional designations that that we participate in that may not be an official count official map entry but things like like you said the capital region uh here over in seattle we talk about uh the puget sound area or uh where i grew up in uh, queens we talk about the tri-state area or in california you have the inland empire and all these other different ways that uh folks who are local to your your area uh, know when we're talking about the area even if it is not just designated by specific county so that is a uh, that is a, a really great tool to reflect just that uh, specific area and customize it uh and and we see we have another question here too about how long does it take to create uh, such amazing interactive diagrams. And I think uh, one of the things that's that's really cool, and Kathleen will speak to this in just a moment, we just saw Kathleen just build yes. one out uh, in the space of the, you know, about 35 to 40 minutes while talking through all of this while actually uh, training on it. And uh, when it's time to go ahead and build one out, and as you get a little bit of experience with it, it goes pretty quick. So I would say, Kathleen, if you were to just build the uh, equine model from scratch, uh, just uh, for you know to meet your deadline, uh, how long would that that typically take you? It would probably take me uh, half an hour to build the frame of it, and then artistically, I could spend a lot of time fine tuning it as like. You know, is is in that part can go as long as I want it to go. <laughs> but if I'm on deadline, it can be done in 15 minutes. You know, so I can do this in under an hour. You know, if it's really quick and simple, under you know 30 minutes. But it does it does also depend on the underlying data set and how clean it is. These ones off of the government website, I have to admit, some of them are pretty darn clean to begin with. Um, other data sets that you get from government. I'm sure you all will know and understand as reporters, they, they're a mess. They can be an absolute mess. And, and they can be PDFs, which are generally a disaster to deal with. So um, if you have a nice, clean, beautiful data set, you can go quickly. But you do, if it's not clean, you have to spend some time. I just wanted to show on this one. This is yeah, another example. Can you example of download smart. any of the data from like John Hopkins GitHub? Or this is New York Health System, right? This is the New York system. I use that same kind of uh, that that New York open data set, yeah. mm -hmm. but the Johns Hopkins data is available for free through the AP, the Associated Press, hosted on data.world, and it's nice and clean. It's beautiful. Oh yeah, I've been looking at data.world. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. Bye -bye. And Diana, this is, this is another nice. question. This is another example of uh, the uh, bookmark. Some, I think it's kind of fascinating to look at the log scale, and this is just this one visual brings you to another way to look at it so I can sw switch back and forth between the log scale and the linear scale. Well, this brings this is a nice segue actually to coronavirus because uh, I'm going to switch back to this is a template from Microsoft that they have built and is available to for anyone to use. And you can just use the iframe version of it. It's like an embed code and just pop it onto your website right now and it updates maybe hourly it updates quite a bit um, so it's a very up-to-date information this is just usa and it's interactive if you click on a state you're going to see the the visual change the daily cases down here and the daily deaths you can also download it to your own computer on your, your power bi and and customize it and localize it a bit and that's what we're going to do i'm going to show you how to customize it so we're going to create Here's, a, here's another, we're going to create a county view. So you can choose a state and then and then click on a county and see the, the different counties. So there'll be a map. And on the left side, there'll be a bar chart showing the cases and deaths. And these right here, this, this area and this area, these are called dynamic text boxes. So they will change based on what you click. So let me click, click another county here. And watch what happens over here. We're on Westchester County now, and I'll tell you how many cases there are, how many total deaths, and what the fatality rate is. So very interactive. So, so uh, 
Kathleen, uh, we do have a question here as well that I'm seeing. Great. And with this view uh, of how do you create multiple charts on a single screen? Well, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to show you. Ben, fantastic. OK, so say you've downloaded this and you and you want to create your own kind of version of it. I'm going to open a, a brand new page down here. I click on that plus button and that brings up a blank page for us. And I'm going to show you how first I want to create that filter where you filter down to a particular state. So let's bring over. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to select the slicer. Remember that slicer we had done for the tracks. This is a slicer that for we're going to filter by by the uh, state. And I'm going to drag state over or I can I could actually drop it on the the visual itself or I can drop it into this field box. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Now here we see this list again, which is how the tracks showed up, but it's a longer list, a little too long, I think, to show up like that. So I'm gonna make it a drop down list. I'm gonna click on this arrow right here and select drop down. And you see that saves a lot of real estate. I'm gonna move this container box right up there. It's kind of good practice to keep your container box um, tight to your visual so it's it otherwise they'll start bumping up against as you put more elements on the page they'll stop start bumping up against each other so there we have our filter anyone uh, want to see a particular state can you show new jersey we'll show new jersey all right yes we have to get into phase three very strict okay. laws here one thing I want to do, I'm going to I'd like to force this to be you, all the, the users can only select one state rather than being able to sp select multiple states. So with the visual selected, I'm going to go over to my my paintbrush again, so the style, the style menu and under selection controls, I'm going to say single select. That's going to force it to be they can only choose one state. I'm going to again turn the header off the automatic header off, but put my own title on. And we're going to say select a state. And let's make that a little bigger and brighter. I'm going to just make that black. All right, so we got select a state. Now let's let's create that map. I'm going to go over to my visualization page, my area, and click on the filled map. The box shows up here. And I'm over, I'm going to go to my my fields and my data here. And this, if you download this data set, all these fields are going to show up. They are all connected through a um, USA Facts. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan group that uh, tries to make data sets available to the public, the, to the citizens, so they're more informed citizens. And they keep this data updated all the time and available for use through through this API URL connection. Um, all right, so let me grab the the county. We're going to go by county. And I'm going to put that over in the location. And now it should show us New Jersey. There we go. We've got New Jersey there. Uh, let's. Let's, there is one uh, thing you should know about this data set. It, for people who they don't know exactly where they live, maybe they just know they're in New Jersey, uh, they'll say they, they're, they're put into this unallocated, uh, statewide unallocated um, uh, type. And we for, for the map, we need to get rid of it. We will, they'll be in, represented in the, the bar chart, but not in this map. So this was a chance to show you the filters and how they work. I'm going to right now it knows that county we're already looking at county. So I'm going to click that down and change it from basic filtering to advanced filtering. And I want to get rid of the unallocated for the maps. So instead of contains, I'm going to say does not contain. So any field, any county field that does not contain unallocated will stay it will be will show up on this map and I'm going to hit apply filter. Now right now everything's just showing up as a basic purple. Everything's colored the same. I'd like to change how it's colored based on the number of cases 
in each county. So to do that, we're going to head back over to that, the styling, the formatting tab. We have 21 counties. 21 counties. All right. Well, that's already in the data, so I don't even have to deal oh, okay. with all 21 of them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to click on data colors. And here, see this formula? That's a formula symbol there. I'm going to click on that. And this dialog box comes up to help me create the, the styling on it. And we want to format by a color scale. And we want based on the field, we want it based on the number of cases. So I'm going to choose cases. And the lowest value, I'm going to make that a, a little light purple. And the highest value, I'm going to make that a dark purple. And I hit OK. There we go. We see a little more, more variation there. And I'm not a fan of this particular background map, so there, I'm going to change that. I'm backing over, back over to my Format tab, the Paintbrush. And I'm going to look under Map Styles. And the theme I'm going to change right now, it's Road Theme. I'm going to change it to Grayscale, which is, I think, a very nice looking, nice looking um, map. Now I'm going to resize it a bit, adjust that. And when I hover on it, I can see a little information. I can see what county that is. Um, just gonna, I'm going to get rid of that title again. I don't think we need any title. Turn that off. And now someone had asked about creating multiple visuals on one page. And here we go. We're going to do it. Now I'm going to create that the bar chart that's going to accompany this. So I make sure that I have nothing selected on the page. Now I go over to my, my visual pane over here and choose which visual I want. I want another column chart. I click that, shows up over here. And now let's decide what we want to put in it. We want to put in, we want to see the number of cases and deaths by day. So let's go over to our fields. And here we have cases. We'll put that in the values. And we want deaths. We'll also put that in values, and we want it by date. Where's my date? Right there. I'm going to put that on I've axis. I've had to ask that question way too many times at coffee shops. <laughs> <laughs> and by default, um, Power BI makes it a hierarchy. It's broken down by year, quarter, and month. I don't want that. I want to change it just to the individual date. So I click on this little arrow, and I change that to date. And there we go. I'm going to make that bigger so you can see that. And there it shows up. So now we have two visuals on the same page. I'm going to change the colors a little bit here. Let's make the cases and deaths not exactly purple. I'm going over to my styling tab again, clicking on data colors. Cases, I want the cases to be a deep purple. And the deaths to be orange to make them stand out a little bit. And now let's see how they interact. And again, the interaction is going to be by default. It is it's going to click on Bergen County. And you can see Bergen County and actually showing up a little bit down here. It's highlighting it. Um, there are uh, several different interactions you can choose. You can choose to have no interaction. You can choose to have a highlight or you can choose to have it filter down just to Bergen County. And right now you can't, it's doing a highlight and you really can't see it. So I want to change that. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the edit interactions. I go to the format tab and I'm going to click, when I click on edit interactions, you're going to see some new tools show up right around here. So here I click and there we see we have the, these tools. This is nothing should happen if you click on it, click on the map. Highlight should happen if you click on the map, and filter should happen. So I have the map highlighted, right, the map selected right now, and I'm going to choose filter. So now when I click on the map, Bergen County, it just filtered to Bergen County. I'll, choose, I'll select another county so you can see that change. And it is good because uh, there's a lot of travel from Bergen to New York to work there. That's how the travel brought the virus, New Jersey, yeah. at the beginning. Let's and let's choose a, another state. Let's go to California. Yeah, this one. Can you save it and oh. email me or send me the New sure. Jersey map? 
Now look at how so that curve this works. All available, and we'll we'll talk about that. But I but you did bring up a great point, uh, Kathleen, as you pull up California, which is where I am now, with <laughs> uh, on the other, but on the Understood. north, as opposed to Alex is on the on the south. But um, you know, going through the data, what's valuable about tools like Power BI and you know earlier, Kathleen mentioned Tableau or Excel, is that when you're gathering the data, it can be so <laughs> overwhelming, and these kinds of visualizations can help guide you to the storytelling. Oftentimes we come with a hypothesis and try to, you know, kind of shove the visualization to, to a certain perspective, but then data can lead us into different angles of the story, which, you know, Kathleen, I'm sure you run into like every day. Yes. And sometimes I use Power BI simply if I get a massive data set and have no idea what to make of it, I, I create a almost like a, a workspace um, a playground where I just play with the data and try to find the story in the in the data. I actually have a, a, a example of that. I'll just flip over to that right now. This is where to go. This is um, the AP put out this great data set looking at all the subsidies that Trump had given farmers and it was filled like it was broken down by county, broken down by what type of what type of farmer they were, whether they did soybeans or were hog farmer. And it even had the name of the, the farms. So um, this was simply for reporter expl exploration. And I, I did several pages and, and kind of summarized the data in, in several different ways, hoping to find the story. <laughs> All right, I'm going to flip back to our, our, our chart here. All right, we're doing great. We have our two visuals. Both on the so someone had asked about how do you put two visuals on the same page? You you just uh, literally slap them on and they will interact automatically. Um, you, but you can you can um, edit those interactions as I just did. And and I think that's one of the things that really amazed me the first time I saw this was that when you add that second uh, visualization. Uh, to that page, it's automatically linked to that first visualization. You don't have to go ahead and manually associate different fields and link different uh, columns together in order to make the two of them work together. It it just automatically ties it in, and then of course you have the ability to edit. But just doing that part uh, to begin with is is really powerful. All right, so now we need a we need a title, a headline for this. And this is an opportunity for me to show you the, the dynamic text you can create in, in Power BI. We are going to use a visual called the Enlightened Data Story. And this is not one of the default ones. This is one I had to use, click on these three dots and go out and, and download it. Um, but it's already here. So I'm going to see use it right there. There's Enlightened Data Story. I add that. You see this box show up right over here, this empty box. It's, so it's asking, what value do you want in there? I want the the name of the county or state to show up, depending on what people have selected. Right now, it's, it's showing California. But with Enlightened Data Story, you can tell a little story. So I'm going to click over to that. Oh, looks like Kathleen's frozen a little bit. She'll probably be right back. She did warn that there was a thunderstorm passing in her area. So those of you in the New York area probably might be experiencing that as well. So, um, all right. And, uh, but uh, Thomas, yes. Um, actually, the thing about Power BI, and you can check it with that, is that it's actually a twofer where it is for investigative reporting. And if you don't have a graphic desk or resource area, I think that's what's valuable with the cutbacks that are happening, um, um, like, you know, uh, for the last 20 years, frankly. It, there's so much pressure to try to tell stories in so many different ways and have less and less resources to do so. Um, this one is a really sophisticated way of trying to do go beyond charts and tables, uh, and um, which are not particularly engaging. And also, too, for audiences, as we have said before, and readers and whatnot, they want to be able to find for themselves. Like, they want to explore the data. Like, is the data valid? Um, is the data... Um, you know, uh, so, you know, is this something that I can even access? 
So she'll probably join very soon. Uh, and so I think while we're waiting for yeah. while we're waiting for Kathleen to come back, one of the themes that I'm seeing in the the meeting chat overall is questions about uh, where these visualizations live, how you get it onto your website, how you go ahead and share this beyond. And I think we wanted to address that real quick. And that's that one of the things is once you create these visualizations, our goal here is not necessarily to create the static image. It's something that you're audience can interact with so where many of the ah, hey i see kathleen has joined us again and i'm going to surrender the mic in just a moment there it's always dangerous when i get my hands on a microphone again <laughs> uh, but a lot of these visualizations will really live on your uh publications uh portal whether that's going to be your website or uh or another page and the great thing is that one of the things we can do is we can actually embed them as an iframe uh, so what that means that once you create this visualization, it'll live on our server and then you could just embed that in the page for your article or wherever else you will accept those iframes and your audience can go ahead and interact and choose their own county and choose their own state as they continue to explore that data and really create their own story from it. And that's some of the real powerful stuff. And then of course you can also, uh, as Kathleen said, you can incorporate them into a PDF or you know always grab it as a still graphic image or whatever you wanna do with that. But that gives you that flexibility to actually make them available to your audience and it also means that even as as kathleen goes ahead and, and shows us when you choose a particular county in new jersey for that uh that that graphic and for that chart to look at what's happening with covid um that is not where it stops because once you release that to your audience they have the ability to then go ahead and pick a different county so that they can see those results and it will all be dynamically updated in real time and kathleen i'm going to give it back to you now and i'm hoping i didn't misstate anything because uh a week ago i didn't know anything about this <laughs> <laughs> that's okay bill that's why that's why i'm here to eavesdrop as well uh, and, and to learn from both of you. But um, I also wanted to give a little bit of update on time. I know some people could only spare the hour. I'm glad that a lot of you are still staying on. Um, Kathleen is nearing the end of this particular COVID-19 demo, and then we're going to answer more questions, including uh, taking on a little bit of the larger talk of, topic of data gathering to begin with and um, wrap up with sharing. Uh, I'll share my screen to share a bunch of uh, resources, and then the, the, that will also be shared via email as well. Okay. So there's a thunderstorm moving through my area, and I was a little worried about electricity going out, and it, it did quite dramatically there. Sorry about that. Um, I did want to show you this one last thing. This is the data story. I think I was interrupted right then. Um, so now we're going to tell the, the little story here, and I click over to the, the formatting tab, click on story, and let's see. my notes sorry uh, so under the story under this text area you type wherever that little hashtag showed up that's what's going to show the the value that you chose to show up there which I chose county or state so wherever we want that hashtag that that number or, or piece of information is going to show up so we here's our our title is county level view of reported COVID-19 cases in, and I'm gonna put that hashtag right there. Oh, I deleted there, county level view of reported cases. You know, I think my computer is objecting to being hit by lightning or something. <laughs> is giving me a little bit of a hard time. Oh, there we are. It looks like we just had a little bit of lag there. No, it's, still, it, it's still lagging heavily. Okay. So maybe we should go to the question phase, I think, Bill. Okay, great. Uh, so one of the uh, questions that we had come up 
was that to do this uh, work professionally, do you need to be familiar with the Microsoft applications or uh, is there a different type of training? And I always like to take this moment to say that for organizations that have already deployed Microsoft 365 Teams and Office, we do have some great product training available for those platforms as well. But uh, Kathleen, so do folks need to know the Microsoft apps to really use uh, Power BI? You don't have to. Um, it certainly eased my uh, learning curve by knowing Excel before I started doing this. But if you're familiar with Google Sheets or, or some other type of spreadsheet, um, it, it, it'll make it easier, but you don't have to. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, Dimitri had a, a great uh, a great question as well about some of the, the bigger picture stuff here, which is, I mean, this, I mean, we're able to tell great stories with data, but how, how do you find the right source for that data to begin with? Uh, can you share some guidelines like this? For example, he cites the example of, um, he made a story about the uh, US gambling industry, uh, especially as gambling was just uh, legalized in the Ukraine, uh, and uh, they wanted to know more about what's happening in the US industry. Uh, and ways to get things like correct data about profits and numbers and losses during the pandemic and all that stuff. So, mm. I mean, how do you find the source data for the uh, stories you want to tell with Power BI? There are more and more data sets being available on government, open government websites, often ho hosted by the government, which is wonderful, but uh, they're not always there. We do use Freedom of Information Act um, requests to, to get data often, and it's a, it's a very um, effective way to get the, the data. Um, you can request the whole database and ask for it in an electronic form, and, and that way is a handy way to get it. Um, you can also make it yourself, but with something like gambling in every state, that'd be really hard to recreate on your own. Um, and, it, and that's probably a very state by state data set. So that's a tough one. But yeah. uh, you and just kind of work, yeah, the, work for it. Yeah, exactly. And, and actually, there are probably people on the call if you want to either share in the chat, or if you want to take, since we have about 16 minutes left, you, you, got, you guys are welcome to unmute yourself, but let's, let's not have too much chaos. But for this particular question, Dimitri, um, just to, to chime in what Kathleen says, unfortunately, um, the gov our government uh, has um, a uncertain record in record keeping, let's just say that. So it depends on staffing as well for the state by state. Oftentimes, what's a good way is to find out if there is a professor who is doing a research paper on a particular topic and they're the ones. So for instance, the um, we have two topics that's available and we'll share the resources right in a second up on voter turnout as well as campaign finance. We got that from a uh, university of, uh, for one of them, we got that from a university of Florida professor who tracks that kind of information. And he also cleaned it up because the one thing about Power BI, I know that Kathleen was able to make it look like at that back end, it looks great once you get the data, but I think we all know with the, this kind of reporting, getting the information, making sure it's the right kind of information, not making false comparisons with it, um, you know, trying to make a data set in which the uh, the time period covers the same, you know, and also too, are we telling the story the right way? You see, so many people are frustrated actually with COVID nineteen information because um, for a long time without testing what was the validity of saying the number of cases, right? Because you couldn't test everyone and more people were more interested in seeing like the number of hospitalizations as well as death rate. And that became a more meaningful uh, number than cases tested. We still deliver that, you know, information, but it's still very frustrating to people. So when you create a data set like that, what is the judgment that you make? Um, what is the asterisk that you put? What are the comments that you do? What is what do you put in the context of the reporting when you show that one visualization? But beware, right, that people might just show a screenshot of your vi visualization. We all have responsibility of presenting the information um, the best way. So, Dimitri, did you have any other follow up to that question? Oh, yeah, thank you so very much. Just a short question. Could you recommend any database which might be integrated with your products? Uh, because I appreciate the answer that we may send a request and use the freedom of information, right? But, you know, it may take centuries to get an answer. So could you recommend any sources which you are using practically in your, in your job 
and maybe uh, it, it it may be sources which may be uh, which we may, we may integrate with these products. Thank you. Well, first, for, for your experimenting with this, I would highly recommend just using a, a, a data source that you know well and, and, and are very comfortable with. It might just be an Excel spreadsheet that you already have at this point. And that's a great way to, to explore and experiment with Power BI. Um, but then when you get more comfortable and want to find more data sets, there are these government websites, USA.gov, um, I think, data.gov.us, something like that. Um, the census has data that you can download and each state, individual state has data sets that you can download. The, the World Health Organization has an incredible download, um, downloadable data sets. They, they are out there. Um, Pro so probably, start there yeah, before, probably before, before like doing a, a freedom of information. And Yes, yeah, say probably things like the SEC and the FDA and some of those other FAA has tremendous databases. Lots of these organizations uh, within the U.S. level probably are going to have some great resources as well as as well as I'm, I imagine other countries around the world also do make some data available. So uh, one thing I would add to that is uh, so in the chat, if you have a particular place that you often go for data uh, for databases in your own country or your own uh, locality. Uh, what are some of your favorite sources for that? And while you guys are writing that in, the, the data.world is hosting a lot of data sets from uh, like Johns Hopkins and the Associated Press and the New York Times. They're putting their COVID numbers in there for public use yes. and they're updated all the time. It is a great Yeah, resource. I'm using that uh, because yeah. I'm doing some volunteer work for the national COVID national data science, you know, science. And I use the data.world to look at mask laws okay. and uh, positivity. And it has been presented at the Senate floor by an organization called ncoronavirus.org developed in Harvard and MIT. So, and Alex is, oh, sorry, go ahead. And then another source, if anybody wants to look at 65 plus, is medicare.gov. Mm -hmm. To look at payer and, you know, other kind of data for COVID-19 <clears throat> people affected, uh, you know, very largely older population. That's US only. I see Alex has his hand raised. I have a feeling he's going to plug AFC. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, uh, Caitlin, so based on your experience, do you consider uh, this type of data tools, data sets are always a good choice to add value to our stories? Or again, based on your experience, sometimes it can lead to a confusing, uh, uh, it can be confusing for the audience or for, um, you know, for the um, readers. And based also in your uh, discussions with editors and stuff. And, and the second part of the question is, uh, how do you see the future of, of data journalism? Because when I went to college not so long ago, it was uh, fairly important. But now I see, nowadays I see um, uh, in college uh, journalism, uh, data journalism is one of the key uh, subjects. All right. Well, your first question, I'd say not every story is going to have an interactive or even a chart. So it takes some discussion. Um, and also time-wise, I, I don't have, we, I'm the, the, the data desk of one, so I, I'm not able to do it for every single story. But on our Sunday stories, on our deeper dive stories that have a data set available, we like to try to make it available to the reader so they can make some you know, insights and, and and look into the data themselves. And it also, we think it increases engagement in the story and keeps them on the story longer. So I think that's absolutely beneficial. The future, I, the future is interesting. I, when I started doing this, um, I, I went to the some conferences, NICAR, the, oh gosh, I'm, it's such a strange name. I forget the, what it stands for, um, but it is for data journalists and the, the, the conference is getting bigger and bigger every year and you're seeing um, a lot of students there. They're, they're catching on that it is important, but it's still in its infant stage. It's not too late to get into this. Um, I In New York State, I've, I've won a couple statewide prizes for my data visualizations and often I'm the only uh, 
entry into the category because mid-sized newsrooms like like ours don't have the resources. Um, and that's why I think Power BI has been is it an accessible resource for smaller newsrooms or individual journalists working on their own. Um, I think it is a good way to get into this field. And, and I would just add on to that uh, just one other thing too. You know, obviously, uh, what we're doing with Power BI and these local data sets is really about empowering uh, folks at that mid-size level, at that smaller newsroom level, to be able to tell some really great stories. Just to give you a little bit of a look at what some of the future can look like when you really leverage the power of things like AI and machine learning. We actually have a project called Project Ida that we've been doing some uh, really big things on with uh, Microsoft, and this is getting gets to the bigger level, so probably not something you would deploy on your own, but I just added a link to that if you wanted to learn more information about how you can use artificial intelligence to even get beyond what we do in Power BI. It's great for structured data, but when you have all sorts of unstructured data, there's a lot of really cool things we can do as well. So uh, I did want to just uh, share that uh, as well. And so in the chat, we've shared a, a whole series of links and I can and in about a couple minutes, I'll share my desktop so you can visually see that. Um, I am a little sad that one of the people had to drop out uh, that he was interested in checking this out, but it looked like it was more for an image editor. And again, um, as someone who has been on the feature side, I found that it was very important to think visually about a story and you know, people always blame the younger generation, but it's always been this way where there's people who are just they consume news visually or information visually. And so there shouldn't be this judgment that people are uh, don't read anymore. People there are people who there are types of people who read deeply. But frankly, we you know this if you've been in if you've been alive for longer than 20 minutes uh, uh, that, you know, that um, information comes in a tsunami overload. And we're asking people to pay attention to the news, but also how do they define news and information, right? They look at social media, they look at YouTube, they look at their television stuff, they look at Netflix. And although we define news in very specific ways, uh, sometimes someone who's outside the industry, you know, they might look at entertainment and sports coverage and uh, they see they don't see that as news. We consider it as part of news, but then, you know, the standards are different. And so when they when people talk critically about information that's coming through, that confusion can translate. So I think it's very important to be respectful in terms of how people consume information. Um, and, and if you can convey very complex issues uh, in something in an easy way for them, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that said too, I've seen, um, and this is me because my, my background is uh, entertainment and features. And frankly, I did that because I felt like um, there's much more influence that can be done in that kind of reporting than breaking news sometimes. And so what are some issues that you consider are societally important? Um, can you imagine a Pirate Bay visualization on racial equality in terms of um, uh, film, film roles, right? Uh, what are some of the things that you can look at salaries and sports? So there's very, there's, so there's traditionally, quote, softer beats that you can use uh, that yield very important data that talk about, you know, or, you know, give a snapshot of society and tools like Power BI and other th things can help as well. By the way, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, Bill uh, helps with the Office 365, now known as Microsoft 365. That's a suite of tools that's like Excel, Word, Teams and all that with, um, for that kind of training, how to help your newsroom. Uh, if Power BI is like a little bit of that extra jump, Excel has gone through tremendous um, strides and there's actually visualizations which are not interactive, but they're screenshots that you can make. So if you are again, uh, in, you know, freelancing or trying to do something on the side for yourself or you just don't have the resources, sometimes doing something, um, doing that kind of analysis is more important. But if you have to have the visual, you can do the pie chart, do the screenshot and then, you know, um, uh, use that as a visual asset as well. Um, and I'm going to present in a moment, but uh, Bill, Kathleen, and anyone else on the call, do you have any other questions? I think um, Zan was raising his hand. Zan Ali? You need to unmute yourself. You're muted, Zan. Yes, okay. I would like to ask uh, two small parts of uh, digital reporting or data journalism. If you allow me, I can ask a simple questions. Go ahead. Okay. 
uh, initially, uh, uh, basically, I am working for TV channel in Pakistan. In Pakistan, there is no opportunities for the data journalism because uh, they think that uh, TV did not follow the all these parameters, especially the data journalism. They need breakings. They ha- they do not have too much time to do all this work, especially on research work. So what can we do as a TV reporter? As, as well as I am also a part of a, a Karachi Press Club governing body. So initially we have tried to start the training of data journalism to the journalists, to the local journalists who are working in Pakistan. But initially we are uh, trying to uh, train some journalists, but they say that there is no opportunities for the data journalism. There are opportunities of CEJ, Central for Excellence in Journalism, but they are not focusing on data journalism. So uh, the important thing is if you are going uh, with the worldwide, you have to follow the new rules for the journalism. If you do not allow or if you do not uh, provide a specific space for data journalism, how it would be helpful for us, especially in Pakistan region? Um, I, I think, you know, maybe there's not jobs per se for data journalists right now, but you can carve it into your job. And that's exactly how I started in my newsroom. I just started with, I was a health reporter at the time. There were a lot of health data sets available. And I started digging into them and creating on deadline data type stories. So I was just a health reporter. They didn't even see it coming, to be honest. And I I developed more and more data stories and and then did a a big story where I looked and ranked uh, hospitals. And I think that's where a light bulb went on. And I started helping my other colleagues with their data stories. And I kind of created the job within our newsroom. So maybe the editors and the the managers don't see it. They don't even understand that that it's needed. But if you start doing it, they'll see the value. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm also sharing on the screen, if you can see the data journalism playbook. This was, again, uh, the Seattle TV station. They, uh, we worked with them. Uh, what happened was Tegna, which is the larger broadcast uh, chain that I think you guys are familiar with. They actually chose a couple of stations to see, like, you know, what kind of innovations can we do? They didn't necessarily define data journalism that innovation, but that's one of the directions that they went. And so we worked with them with Power BI as well as other things as well. Um, one thing also, uh, you know, with Kathleen's approach, she picked a story that was, you know, uh, trenchant at the time. You could also think of a story. Well, you know, COVID-19 obviously is a pandemic story that's going to be with us for some time. But if you know of a story that comes up year round, um, uh, so then you can kind of devote the resources to it. And it's an evergreen topic, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, in the, you know, uh, in there's been quite a few homicide databases um, that have been kept up. And I know, for instance, my local paper, San Francisco Chronicle, you know, had a homicide database. When the reporter left, the database stopped being updated. It wasn't as though people stopped doing homicides, right? And then, you know, so then there's also the obligation that you have to an audience. And I think that's a frustration. And you see this in studies all the time that people want um, the whole story and the background, they don't just want incremental updates. And a database can help to in- cover the incremental updates as well as a larger story. Um, just because we have three minutes left on the call and I want to thank everyone for joining, but I want to go through really quickly some of the resources that we're sharing. Um, so this is the um, uh, one of the links which has Microsoft 365 for journalists. It has down here, you know, many tools from Microsoft that can help you out. We also have the sharpen data journalism skills. And if you look through each one, you know, we even have, and I'm sorry, I'm my laptop's a little slow. We even have an anatomy of Power BI for data journalism. So you can go ahead and, and download all this information. Uh, the playbook, as I mentioned before, um, you, we have training sessions in which we have a, a longer one, which you can do step by step which is geared towards newsrooms, how to use, and we use US census data just as a way to learn Power BI. Like, how do you tell the story of the US census using, uh, and then here's a particular tool that you can use. And we also have, as we mentioned, off the shelf visualizations that if you guys just wanna do an iframe and put it right up, you're welcome to do that. It, you don't have to do anything, but we also include information on you know, how to kind of reverse engineer this a little bit, but we try to make these as simple as possible. So we have, again, voter turnout, historical voter turnout, the 2020 election campaign contributions, and what Kathleen showed today, which was the COVID-19 cases. Um, 
And then so there's other links that I shared at larger Power BI, which again is uh, beyond news industries to many, many different industries, but they did end up using our parliament uh, a project, which is great. That gives you sort of a larger overview. Um, and then there is self-paced learning that I shared with the educator. Again, this is not geared towards journalists. So um, this is like a little different way to approach it. I would encourage you to go through our site first so that yeah. you can just get, um, a quick overview before you go a little bit deeper. And then yeah. I just wanted to show this one last thing that was very fun that the Power BI education team did with um, NASA, where they actually made a quiz. This is actually still built out of Power BI. I'm working off my internet, so it's not going to be very fast. So I'll share the link for this as well. But it was uh, one quick question. Um, how do you save your chat on Microsoft team? I'm, I know I use Zoom all the time. Oh, the chat will still be persistent when you leave the call. But um, we will definitely pull out things. Bill, right? We were talking about pulling out yeah. things there. And this call oh. is recorded. So okay. we, yeah, and we'll give this to Alex. But okay. um, this is one creative way in which you can cover everything from gambling to equine mortality to, you know, and but in this particular case was a quiz on what do you think it takes? Uh, how much uh, exposure do you think people have? to radiation and they and the results i'm not going to go through it now but it's cute they they symbolize radiation in bananas because again it's for kids so you know they wanted to give something that um kids could understand but imagine and what's key to like what we want to talk about is and when we talk about resources can you create a visualization that you can reuse just by substituting the data and cover all sorts of different topics i think that's very key in terms of getting the approval from your newsroom to do something like this that you think is important and then showing them how you can maximize that resource uh, over and over and over again. Uh, so I just want to wrap up uh, anything from Kathleen, Bill and Alex. I'm good. Best of luck, everyone. Thanks for a lot. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yes, from our end. Uh, thank you so much. It's been great and we're looking forward for the next training with uh, Microsoft and Microsoft News. Thank you. Yep. Thank you everyone for your time today. Really look forward to uh, working together more in the future. And uh, if you create any really cool visualizations with Power BI, come back to this chat and go ahead and share them or go ahead and shoot us an email and let us know. Will do. Thank you. Thanks, what everyone. is the email address for contact? Thanks, Thank you so much. We're going to share everything with Alex so that in one oh. neat document and that way he can share it with everyone. I think that'll okay. be the easiest way to do that. Uh, yeah. I am a okay. member of uh, AFC. Yeah, that's right. So, he'll, yeah, he'll send you the good stuff. Okay, thank you so much for your time. This was very thank you. educational, informative, and right timing for COVID. Yes, definitely. Thank you for being so involved in the yes. conversation. Thank you very much for the. Yeah, so we'll get it from Dennis. See the annual radiation to this calculator. Yeah. So if you want to exit the, the call, there's a bright red leave button. Not that I'm pushing you out, but I know sometimes you feel trapped. <laughs> thank, you so thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with everything. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Brigitte looks like she's trying to ask us a question. Oh, Brigitte, are you are you trying to ask us a question? You're on mute. Uh, can, I, I can unmute people. Oh, no. Well, did she leave? I think she left. Oh, no, Brigitte's still on. Yeah, I'm just looking at the radiation doses calculator. Yeah, it's really cute, right? It's it's very cute. Brigitte. <laughs> oh, I just accidentally muted everyone. OK. Oh, I can't unmute. Oh, that's right. I can't unmute people. Brigitte, are you trying to ask a question? Or are you okay? She, I think she's leaving. All right, I'm going to end the call. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank bye. you. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to remember how to end the call. <laughs> oh, let's see. Hold on. End the call. Uh, yeah, okay. another thing that could be useful, interesting, you know, the carbon.